In this chapter, I'd like to continue our modeling with the traffic loader task. I will go through the workflow to set up the traffic loader correctly. At the moment, I'm working on the model code ptc underscore bridge.sophistic, which can be found on your desktop in the subfolder named ptc underscore bridge. However, if you continue modeling from this stage, this model can also be found in the corresponding model 5 folder of this chapter. Now I would like to go through the workflow of the traffic loads graphical task. The workflow that I am about to introduce to you follows the existing tab of the traffic loader graphical task. So in the task first we need to define the lanes by selecting an axis and generate the lanes based upon this axis. Then in the next step we need to define the load trains according to the euro code or according to the chosen code. Then we need to calculate the results. So basically we need to select what results we would like to get from this analysis. Then we need to group our loads into the so-called load groups according to the table 4.48 from the euro code. Finally, we need to add some instructions for the software, what type of results we would like to extract from the analysis, and how we would like to represent the results in the report browser. Also, I would like to call your attention to table 4.48 from the Eurocode that we already discussed. And during our example file, we are going to set up our loadings and the envelopes according to group 1 and group 2. This workflow could seem a little bit abstract to you at the moment, but when we go through it in practice you will see it is not a difficult one at all. And this is what we are going to do in the next chapter. In this chapter we are going to set up our traffic loader task. Please double click on the traffic loader task <coughs> and the first tab that we need to fill out is the so-called lanes tab. The definition of the lanes will follow the instructions of the Eurocode. Let me show it to you. According to Eurocode 1991-2, the number of lanes should be established based upon table 4.1, which is presented on the screen at the moment. If the carriageway width, W, which is measured between the curb stones, is smaller than 5.4 meter, then the number of notional lanes will be equal with 1. The width of this notional lane should be taken as 3 meter, and the width of the remaining area will be W minus 3 meter. When the carriageway width is equal or greater than 5.4 meter, but smaller than 6 meter, then the number of notional lanes should be equal with 2. In this case, the width of the notional lanes should be given simply as the width divided by 2, and the width of the remaining area will be equal with 0. So actually, there will be no remaining area. If the carriageway width is greater than 6 meter, then we need to divide this width with 3 meter and take the integer part of this division. The width of the notional lanes in this case will be equal with 3 meter. And the remaining area should be calculated as the width minus 3 meter times the number of the notional lanes. And below we can read an example. For example, when we have an 11 meter width carriageway, the number of the notional lanes will be equal to 3, and the width of the remaining area will be 11 minus 3 times 3, which gives us 2 meter. In addition to this table, the chapter 4.2.4 from the same Eurocode states that for each individual verification, for example, for a verification of the ultimate limit state, of resistance of a cross-section to bending, the number of lanes to be taken into account as loaded, their location on the carriageway and their numbering should be so chosen that the effects from the load models are the most adverse. I would like to point out the wording location on the carriageway. 
because basically after having calculated how many lanes do we need on the bridge to be loaded we also need to position these lanes to get the most severe lane distribution on our bridge deck to be able to extract the most extreme internal forces or internal stresses from our finite elements. This would result lane distributions or lane alignments on the bridge deck. For example, we are going to position our lanes centrally on the bridge deck, but we are also going to inv investigate a right alignment of the lanes and similarly a left alignment of the lanes. Let's see how we can set up these settings under the lanes tab. So first we need to select the axis on which or along which we would like to set up the lanes. As the second step we need to choose the section or maybe better described we need to select the regulation upon which the lanes needs to be created. Then we need to set up the geometry of the bridge deck. We can do that by entering the values for curbstone left, curbstone right, deck left and deck right. These geometrical entities can be seen on this small diagram. The deck left is the outermost edge of the curbstone on the left. Similarly, the deck right is the outermost fiber or edge of the curbstone on the right side of the bridge, whereas the curbstone left is the innermost edge of the curbstone on the left side of the bridge, and the curbstone on the right is the innermost edge of the curbstone on the right side of the bridge. Between the curbstone left and the curbstone right, we can see the lane distribution or the lanes. On the right side of the lanes, then we need to set up the alignment of the lanes. And as I mentioned, we can distinguish with, between a center alignment, a left or a right alignment. One important thing that I would like to mention, if you would like to consider the regulations of the table 4.1 from the Eurocode, then we must select EN as the section. So if we already selected the EN as the section, below the lanes tab, then automatically the center, the right, the left and the superstructure with lane distribution will be created. But of course these alignments are dependent on the dimension of the superstructure, namely the width of the deck. With the help of this automatically generated lane alignment, the most unfavorable loading pattern can be found for every single element in our model. The user just need to decide which lanes to be loaded with what load train to get the most unfavorable combination. One more hint, if you do not want to go with the Eurocode lane definition, then of course you can create your user defined or manually created lanes along the bridge. In the next picture, I would like to explain some of the very important terminologies in the lane definition. A lane consists of a left boundary and a right boundary, as well as a line called YC. The YC is the position of the line along which the load train is moving within the lane. However, this YC line is not necessarily located in the middle of the lane. The loads of the moving load trains are positioned in the lane. For example, as we can see here, the consistent width loading of a load train is positioned within the lane. If the loads of the load train happens to be outside of the lane, those loads will be clipped or they will be simply ignored. As you can see in this picture, the right boundary of the lane and the left boundary of the lane are not necessarily parallel with each other always. The right boundary value of the lane or the left boundary value of the lane can be given or set at the stations. The residual areas are the areas between the edges defined by the width of the load train 
and the edges of the lane itself. I would like to give you an example. For example, if the lane has a width of 4 meter and the load train positioned in this lane is the LM1 load train. And let's suppose that the LM1 loading is positioned in a centric way. Then a width of 0 0.5 meter and 0 0.5 meter on both sides will be considered as the residual area since the width of the LM1 load train is only 3 meter. Finally, I would like to mention the notional lane, which is not generated until a load train is applied or positioned into a lane. For example, the load train LM1 has a defined width of 3 meter, and if it is placed within a lane, then a notional lane will be generated with a width of 3 meter as well. This notional lane is located centric on the line of the YC inside the lane. I know it could be a little bit difficult now to understand this, but I am about to show you now some examples, and I am sure at the end of the presentation of these examples you will understand what is the difference between the lane and the notional lane. Let's get quickly started. Our first example is when the carriageway width is great enough to accommodate exactly 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 or 6 lanes, which means that the carriageway width is exactly 3, 6, 9, 12, 15 or 18 meter. In this case, a lane alignment is generated called center alignment. The lanes from 1 to 6 are positioned from the right side to the left side and all of them get a width of exactly 3 meter. The lanes that allow for 3 meter wide vehicle are highlighted in light blue in the visualization and we call them notional lanes. Let me show you this visualization. As you can see here with light blue color, the notional lanes from 1 to 6. So, as you can see, if you have a carriageway width, for example, as a multiplication of 3 meter, in this case 9 meter, then an alignment called center alignment will be created. The lanes will be allocated from the right to the left, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. All the width of the lanes are 3 meter. And in this case, the lane width is exactly the same as the notional lane width, which is 3 meter. I would like to point out two other columns of this table, namely the left edge and the right edge of the lane. For example, the lane number 1 has the right edge at 9 meter. This value is exactly the same as the curbstone on the right. Here we can see the axis. We need to measure every dimension from this axis. The positive values need to be measured perpendicular to the axis to the right. So positive 9 meter, we are about here or exactly here. The lane width is 3 meter. So 9 minus 3, we are going to get to plus 6, which is here, the dark blue line. Similarly, for example, lane number 6, left edge, is at minus 9 meter, which is exactly the same as the curbstone on the left, minus 9 meter. The lane width is plus 3 meter, so minus 9 plus 3, we reach to the position minus 6 meter, which can be exactly seen here, right edge, minus 6 meter of lane number 6. So this is how the alignment of the lanes looks like when we have a carriageway with a width of 3, 6, 9, 12, 15 or 18 meters. The next example that I'd like to demonstrate to you if the carriageway width is more than 20 meter between the curb stones. Because in this case, another type of center alignment will be generated. The track tempering once again starts with number 1 from the right side 
of the bridge deck and goes up to X to the left side. The generated tracks are placed centric between the curbstones. In this case, the inner tracks have an equal width of 3 meter, but the edge tracks are wider than 3 meter and reach out to the curbstones. Once again, the notional lanes are highlighted in light blue color and indicate the 3 meter wide vehicle on the next slide. So in this slide we can see that the carriageway width is really greater than 20 meter because between the curbstones we can see 23 meter difference. And as I mentioned, the lanes will be positioned and starting from lane number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. The middle lanes have the width of 3 meter, 3 meter, 3 meter, 3 meter and 3 meter. But the lanes on the extreme ends are wider than 3 meter. But the notional lane within the lane is 3 meter and showed with light blue color. Now let's review the left and right edges of these lanes number 1 and 7 in the table below. First let's start with lane number 1 whose right edge is at 11.5 meter which is exactly the same as the curb stone on the right. This 11.5 meter is here curb stone on the right. The left edge of lane number 1 is at 7.5 meter which is this dark blue line here. 11.5 minus 7.5 equals 4 meter lane width. So the lane is really 4 meter wide. However, the notional lane is only 3 meter wide according to the Euro code. And the center of the load train will be positioned centric within this notional lane number 1. Of course, the situation is the very same for notional lane number 7. If we have a closer look, we can see that the lane width is also 4 meter. So the F4 set is also applicable for lane number 7. Now let's move on to the next example. So our next case is if the carriageway width is not equal with an integer multiplication of 3 meter and the maximum width of the carriageway is 20 meter. Basically, this means that the carriageway width is equal or smaller than 20 meter. Then three alignments of the lanes will be generated, which are code centered, left and right. Which will be code center alignment, left alignment and right alignment. In the center alignment, the first lane will be in the middle and the forthcoming lanes are placed altering on the right and on the left side of this lane number one. Those lanes are called lane number two, three, four and five. The inner lanes have an equal width of three meter, but again the lanes on the edges are wider and reach up to the curbstones. If we look at this example graphically, again we can see that the curbstone on the left is set to minus 10 meter, on the right is set to 10 meter. So basically the carriageway width is equal with 20 meters. In this case, the center alignment will consist of notional lane number 1, then 2 on the right, 3 on the left, 4 on the right, 5 on the left. But you need to notice that the lane width of 4 and 5 is 5.5 meter. Let's have a closer look at again lane number 4 in this case which is this dark blue line and the distance from this dark blue line to the curbstone on the right is smaller than 6 meter. Hence we cannot create two new lanes with the width of 3.0 meter. It is only possible to set up one new lane with 5.5 meter in which there will be a 3 meter notional lane and in this notional lane YC line 
is going to be 1.5 meter away from the left dark blue line. We can double check this if we can see that the left edge is at plus 4.5 meter and the YC is at 6. meter, so 1.5 meter away. This is the line of YC. Okay, so this is how the center alignment looks like in this case. Now let's see the right and the left alignment. The right alignment sets up a lane with number 10 aligned to the right curbstone, then lanes from 11 to 15 follow it on the left side. So graphically it looks like this, the alignment right, the notional lane 10 has been generated on the right side of the bridge deck, the lane width and the notional lane width is also equal with 3 meters, then the forthcoming lanes 11, 12, 13, 14 are all equal with 3 meters and the notional lanes are also equal with 3 meters. However, if we add together the 5 times 3 meter, which gives us 15 meter, the remaining distance to the left curb stone is 5.0 meter. Again, the problem is the same. In 5 meter width, we cannot create 2 3 meter wide lanes. So lane 15 will start at this dark blue line and ends up on the left curb stone. In the 5.0 meter width we can set up one notional lane and the YC will be 1.5 meter away from the right side of the notional lane 15. And the remaining area is again residual area. We can also follow this in the table, lane number 50, the lane width is 5 meter. The right edge is at minus 5 meter and really 1.5 meter away at minus 6.5 meter is the location of the YC. Now let's see the left alignment which is very similar to the right one. So the left alignment sets up lane number 20 and the notional lane 20 as well aligned to the left curb stone and lanes number 21 to 25 follow this on the right side. If we look at the left alignment graphically, we will find notional lane 20 aligned to the left curb stone. The forthcoming lanes from 21 to 25 follow, follow this notional lane 20. The first five lane width equal with uh, 3 meter, as well as the notional lane width up to notional lane 24 and notional lane 25 has a 5 meter width again and within this 5 meter lane we can find the notional lane 25 with its width of 3 meter. And we can also see the remaining area as the residual area. Finally we reach the introduction of the last lane which is lane number 0. This lane is always created independent from the width of the superstructure or the width of the carriageway. Lane 0 is generated as the distance between the inner edges of the curbstone plus we need to add the cycleway width or the sidewalk width and this is actually the total width of the superstructure hence we call it superstructure width. Here we can see it on our example file the total uh, width of the superstructure is 22 meter and therefore the lane width for lane number 0 is also 22 meter so basically the whole width of the superstructure and as it is denoted here in the information palette the residual loading area of lane 0 is defined as the superstructure width minus the carriageway width or in other words, the residual area of lane 0 is the width of the cycleway of the sidewalk on both sides. In the next slide I would like to show the lanes distribution in the cross section. 
and also elaborate a little bit more about the lane and the residual area. So as we can see on our superstructure we have our uh, three notional lanes but the outermost lanes are wider than the notional lane and the difference between the actual lane width and the notional lane width will give us the residual area width. Or in other words, residual areas are part of the lane. This means the sidemost lane in this picture have a width of 3 meter plus the width of the residual area. By now I think you have the idea what's the difference between the lane, the notional lane and what does the residual area mean. If you're done with the definition, you need to have a look at the output of the traffic loader task lanes. In the report browser, you will find a table like this, which shows all the lanes from 0 to 99. In this case, we only have four lanes that are presented in this table. Lane 0, 1, 10 and 20. The right edge of the lane, the left edge of the lane and the YC value is always presented in this table and with the help of these three values you can double check whether or not your input is correct. This is something that I encourage you to always do. After having discussed all the details of the lane definition let's uh, set up the lanes for our special example file. For better remembering you can have an overview of the cross-section of the superstructure. In it we can see that the carriageway width is 5.20 meter and the overall width or the superstructure width is equal with 6.3 meter. So these are the values that we need to set up in the lane definition. Now let's go back to SSD and set up the lanes accordingly. Once again I opened the model called ptc underscore bridge dot sophistic which can be found on your desktop in the subfolder named ptc underscore bridge. However this model file can also be found in the corresponding model file folder of this chapter. To set up the lanes you need to double click on the traffic loader and here we need to navigate from the left to the right and from the top to the down. First we need to select the axis which will be the one and only axis in our system called axis. Then we need to select the regulation based upon we would like to create the lane alignments. In this case we are going to choose the EN but I would like to show you there are a lot of other possibilities to choose from. So now we just need to uh, type in the value of the left curb stone which is going to be minus 2.6 meter on the right side it's going to be 2.6 meter and please notice as I click on the next field the geometry will be updated in the top view. By the way this view can be moved or panned with your middle mouse button it can also be rotated with your left mouse button so you can have a live overview about your input. Now let's add the deck left and the deck right values which is going to be minus 3.15 and plus 3.15 and as I click on the next field uh, the view is updated automatically. Let's think about the center alignment a bit. So what we can see that is that the lane width is 5.2 meter. Hence only one notional lane with the width of 3 meter can be created. And with the center alignment the YC will be at 0 meter which is going to be the axis of the bridge. Now let's choose the right alignment. Of course the lane width remained the same, but in this case the 3 meter wide notional lane aligned to the right side and therefore 
the load train will be positioned eccentric to the axis. We can see that the YC value is 1.1 meter and the right edge of the lane is at 2.6 meter. So 2.6 minus 1.1 means the eccentricity is 1.5 meter measured from the curbstone and 1.1 meter measured from the axis. Now let's review quickly the left alignment. Now we can see that the notional lane aligned to the left and of course the same eccentricity can be applicable which means the YC is 1.1 meter to the left of the axis. If we drop down the alignment drop box we will also find of course the superstructure width. This could be a good opportunity to double check the input because now we can find the lane width is 6.3 meter which is the overall width of the superstructure so everything is fine with our input. I think now we finished with the lanes definition and now we need to continue with the definition of the load trains on the next tab. In this chapter we are going to add the load trains to our project. Therefore you need to click on the load trains tab. Since below this tab we have the opportunity to add load trains to our project as you can see on this add load train button. If you click on it, you will find yourself in the import load train to the project dialog box. And by default, only the load trains according to the chosen code is shown below. However, if you uncheck the checkbox here, all the load trains that are available in Sophistic could be inserted into your project. We will stick with the load dependent load trains and going to choose the LM1 load model. From the LM1 load model, you still have three opportunities to choose from. Based upon the Excel load, you can choose the LM1 300, 200 or 100. If we had many lines, then it would be reasonable to choose not just LM1 300, but also, for example, 100 or 200 to load the neighboring lanes. Since in our project we only have one lane, it is enough if we now just choose LM1300 and click on the Add to the Project button. If you do so, you will see that the LM1 load train with 300 Excel load was added to your project and also you will see that this load train received a load case number being equal with 1200. The import load trained to the project window is still open so this means you have the possibility to add new load trains to your project as well. In this case we don't want to add any more road trains so I will just simply click on the close button and on the right side of this dialog box we are going to find the parameters or the properties of the load train. By default the most important parameters are shown but you can show all the parameters of a load train if you select this selection box. The most important information regarding the load train is the number of the load train. If you hover over your mouse to this entry you will see that a value between 1200 and 1300 is requested. Of course you can add different numbers as well but these are the default values that the software would like to get. Then you will find the title of the load train you can also assign the load train, so the load case, to an action, an already existing one. In this case I'm going to choose the none, because what we would like to assign to the action is the result load case of the traffic loader task. Then you can see the axle load of this load train, the traffic lane UDL load of the load train, and also you can see the residual area load of this load train. I think these are the most uh, important properties of the load trains, but of course you can set and have an overview about the other properties of this train. I think I mentioned uh, the most important properties of the load train, but of course later on you can have an overview about all the parameters and maybe you can set them if you want to.
Basically, we finished with the definition of the load train, since in this project we are only going to have this LM1300 load train. And now we can continue our definition with the calculation. If we click on the calculation tab, we will find two main chapters, the envelopes and the settings. In the envelopes chapter, we need to select which type of internal forces we would like to extract as a result and get the envelope diagram of it. Now the system automatically recognizes that we have beam elements in the system and therefore it offers us the integral forces of the beam elements. However, for example, the results of the springs are not included. So we can add a new type of result envelope by clicking on the new button. And as you can see, the forces that are stored in the spring elements is appeared as a result envelope with the load case minimum 15 and load case maximum 16. What do these two numbers mean? Until now, in our model, we only met normal single load cases in which we defined statical loads. However, now we are going to get results from module ELLA, from the traffic loader, and the results needs to be also saved into a so-called result load case to be able to represent, for example, in graphics. Therefore, we will define a base load case number, preferably as a number that can be divided by 100. For example, load case 100. And then the minimum extrema of the normal forces in the beam elements will be stored in load case 101, the maximum in load case 102. Similarly, the minimum MY bending moment will be stored in load case 111 and the maximum in 112. In this particular project, we are going to need the nodal displacements in the global X, Y and Z directions, which in this case will be the nodal displacement in the global X direction, then the nodal displacement in the global Y direction, and then the nodal displacement in the global Z direction. So now we finished with setting up the envelopes that we would like to obtain after the traffic loader task. Now we need to set up the necessary settings. First, we need to define how the transversal load distribution on the bridge tag should be. The transversal load distribution mainly governed by the system that we are working on, for example, whether or not it's a single girder system or a multi girder system or something else. For example, if I have a single girder system that is represented in the top picture and the main beam is perpendicular to the screen and presented as a green dot, then the acting load in the lanes that are presented with red arrows will be transposed to the main beam. And from the eccentric load, we are going to receive a vertical load and a bending moment. Behind the traffic loader task, module ELLA is working. And for ELLA, we need to provide a nodal sequence, or we can also say a beam sequence. If we have a single girdem system, this is easy to find for the software. Basically, the module just need to take the beginning and the end point of the beam element. And this is going to be the big beam sequence to be followed. Along this beam sequence at every node, the effort mentioned load transposition will be undertaken. Based upon this methodology, the influence lines can be established. And finally, the internal force envelope diagrams can be obtained. When we have a multi-girder system, it means we have two main girders in the model. A connection between them transversally can be considered as a hinge connection or a rigid connection. If we consider this connection between the two main girders as a hinged connection, then the vertical loads will be simply transferred to the main girders without adding any additional 
torsional bending moment to the main girders. However, if we consider the connection between the two main girders as a rigid connection, then apart from the vertical loads that will be transferred to the main girders, additional torsional bending moment will be applied to the main girders. The corresponding selection can be made here at the transfer load distribution. If we drop down this list, you will find a single girder system, then you will find the multi girder system which, with the hinged load distribution, and finally you can also select the multi girder system which, with the rigid load distribution. Now I would like to mention what if we have a shell system. So the superstructure is made out of shell elements and we would like to consider the transverse load distribution on this kind of structure. In this case, basically, you need to choose how precise transverse interpolation you would like to perform. And you can control it by selecting the number of the interpolation points within the lane. On the top right diagram, you can see a lane with three given interpolation points. One interpolation points at the left side, one in the middle, and one on the right side. What happens is that a unit load is going to be applied at these locations to determine the transverse influence line, or we can say the transverse load distribution. From these applied unit loads, the ordinate of the transverse influence line can be calculated. And if we simply connect those influence line ordinates, we are going to get the transverse influence line diagram. I would like to point out some consequences. The wider the lane is, then the more precise the transverse influence can be calculated. But on the other hand, the fewer amount of interpolation points is given, the less accurate the transversal influence line calculation will be. But you need to be aware of it that this could increase the running time significantly. To better demonstrate the transverse interpolation, I have prepared a simple sketch. Please try to imagine uh, the cross section of our bridge that are made out of quad elements. So what you can see on the screen is the superstructure that are that are built of quad elements. We would like to get the cross bending moment within quad element number one, which is exactly above the second support. So if we would like to get the cross bending moment in the quad element, then the loads that are applied on the cantilever part will cause here a amount of bending moment. Now I would like to demonstrate if we have a lane with a certain width and I choose the linear interpolation with three unit loads. And I intentionally drew the width of the lane wider than the superstructure itself. If I apply the three unit loads, then the left one will give me no cross bending moment in the quad element number one at all. So the ordinate of the influence line diagram in the transverse direction will be zero. Then in, at the middle interpolation point where I'm applying the one unit load as well, I'm going to get a value which is not zero. Then at the third interpolation point, the unit load will be applied again. But since it is not on the structure, the value of the influence diagram will be zero again. So I will receive a transverse influence diagram with a triangular shape. Of course, the point loads and the UDL loads will be applied on this diagram and the ordinates of these diagrams will be used for further calculations. Now you can easily imagine that if I'm using the interpolation with nine unit loads. As you can see in this very bottom diagram, in which the ordinates are received at every dashed lines, then it is obvious that working with nine unit loads, so choosing the interpolation with nine points, will give you the desired shape 
and values of the transverse influence diagram. So if the running time is not a problem, then I will definitely go with the transverse interpolation with nine interpolation points. If you cannot go for the nine interpolation points, then I would simply suggest you to consider what type of internal force you would like to extract at the end and consider the transverse interpolation based upon it. For example, to assess the cross-bending moment of the quad elements, it is important to make a transverse interpolation as precise as it could be. But for another type of internal force, it could be not so relevant to use these many interpolation points. Now if we go back to our graphical input, I would like to show you where you can find this type of interpolation opportunity, where you can find and select the most suitable interpolation for your project. In our example file, we leave the single girder system since we have only one main beam in our project. Finally, below the calculation tab, we need to set up the vertical influence tab for node search. What does it mean? I will explain it in the next slide. In this explanatory slide, the blue line represents our superstructure that are made out of quad elements, for example. The project contains one main axis, which is called A1, and we also define secondary axis, A1.A, and A1.B. As you can see, the superstructure with the blue line has a crossfall equal with 3% in this case. In order to be able to model this crossfall, we set up the secondary axis A1.A and A1.B. With this approach, it is very easy to define the quad elements between the secondary axis. However, the lanes are always defined in the plane of the main axis, which is in this case A1. And that's why, as you can see with black color, the lanes on the right and on the left will be in the plane of the red horizontal line. This, of course, means that the loads that had been defined in the lanes on the left side cannot be projected on the structure. On the right side, we can see everything is OK. The load that had been defined in the lane will be projected onto the structure. To avoid this situation, you must define a new axis a little bit above of the main axis, only for the definition of the lanes. In the case that could be seen in this line, I would define an A2 main axis, upon which I would set up the lanes something like this. But if I do so, I need to be sure that the load projection is big enough to reach the structure on the right and on the left side as well. And exactly this is the projection that can be set below the calculation tab in the traffic loader. So now we are back in the calculation tab and at the settings, the vertical influence tab for nodal search means exactly this projection of the load. So now we are done with the definition of the calculation settings and we need to continue with setting up the load groups. Below the load groups tab, we can create uh, new load groups. And within these new load groups, we can set up cases from which the effect on the carriageway will be the most adverse. Let me refer back to this slide where it is written that the number of the lanes to be taken into account as loaded and their location on the carriageway and their numbering should be so chosen that the effects from the load models are the most adverse. So basically we have already set up the lanes and their distributions like center alignment, left alignment and right alignment. And now we just need to place or position the loading in these lanes and in these alignments to get the most adverse effect on the carriageway. 
and this is exactly what we are going to do below the new load group please click on the new load group and add a title to this load group as TS for the tandem system then simply just accept the base load case number to be 100 and do not forget that on the calculation tab we set up the maximum and minimum values for the load cases and those numbers will be added to this base load case number. The loads of the tendon system will be assigned to the action gr underscore t because this was the action that we explicitly set up for the tendon system loads. Then we need to create a new case by clicking on the new case button. Here first we need to set up the alignment of the lanes. Let's start with the center, this is fine. Then we need to select which part of the predefined load train we would like to use. This means the following, for example in this case the LM1 predefined load train will be used. However, this load train has many type of loads, for example vertical point loads in the tandem part, vertical uniformly distributed loads. This loading also contains horizontal forces for example, but also a loading that could be applied on the footways and the cycle tracks. And all of these type of loading is stored within the LM1 load train. Now we just need to instruct the software which part of this load train or which part of this loading we would like to read out. Because now first we're dealing with the tandem system, please choose the GR0 which is going to read out the point loads or the tandem loads of the LM1 load train. In the next line we need to select the train that we would like to position in this lane. Of course in our case we can only select one load train, the LM1 300. As soon as I selected it, the load train was displayed in the top picture and represent the tandem system of the LM1 load model. Now we finished with the case 1, but we need to create new cases when the alignment of the lanes is not the center one, but for example the right one and we need to also position the LM1 load train within it. Do not forget to choose the GR0 load group. So now we are using the right alignment of the lanes. You can see it also from the lane number and we positioned the LM1 300 in it and using only the tandem loads of this load train. Lastly, we need to create a new case for the left alignment in lane number 20 and we need to position the load train LM1300 in it and choose the tandem system of it. Now we've finished with the definition of load group 1 in which we were dealing with the tandem system of the LM1 load train and we positioned the load train in every possible lane alignment to get the most adverse effect on the carriageway. Now we need to create a new load group for the uniformly distributed load. So we simply click on the new load group button and we can see load group 2 has been inserted. Then the actions these loads to be assigned to will be the gr underscore u which was originally created by me for the UDL loads. And as we saw in load group 1 definition, we need to set up new cases. In case 1, we are going to use the center alignment of the lanes. In the group part, we need to select the part of the LM1 loading that we would like to use. In this case, it's going to be the GRU, the UDL part of the LM1 loading. Then we just need to assign the loading to the lane. So instead of the no load, I'm going to choose load train 1200. And as you can see in the top picture, 
the UDL load was positioned in the center alignment of the lanes. And if we zoom in a little bit, we can see that on the carriageway, it is going to be 9 kN per square meter applied, and on the residual areas, 2.5 kN per square meter. Now we just need to create new cases within this load group 2 and choose the right alignment of the lanes. In the group, we need to select the GRU. And we just need to simply apply the load drain within this right alignment, like this. And you can see in the top picture that really the notional lane 10 was loaded with the 9 kN per square meter. Now again, we create a new case for the alignment of the lanes. We are going to choose now the left one. From the group drop-down menu, we are going to select again the GRU, add the load train 1200. And finally, we need to create a new case in which we can define the uniformly distributed loads on the footways of the bridge. In this case, we need to choose below the alignment the superstructure width. For the group selection, we need to choose GR3, which stands for the footways and cycle tracks loading. If we select GR3, the software or module Ella will automatically know which type of loading to be applied on the footways from the LM1 loading. Please click on the GR3 and then in the train definition we need to select the residual area load. As you can see in the top picture the hedged area will be loaded with a value of 2.5 kN per square meter which value was taken from the LM1 load train model. According to the regulations of the Euro code, we need to combine the footways uh, loading with the other type of UDL load on the carriageway. So basically, we need to set up combinations and combine together case one, the center alignment UDL loads with the footway loads, or case two with the footway loads, or case 3 with case 4. Since from this combination, either can give the most adverse effect on any of the elements. If we set up these combinations properly, then module Ella in the traffic loader task will calculate the most severe internal force in every beam element. How can we set up this combination? We just simply need to use this combinations button. Please click on it and a new dialog box will appear with the combinations. And simply we need to click on the new button to create new combinations. If I make this window a little bit bigger, we need to set the type to A0. A0 stands for the alternative load group 0. And it also means that I'm going to make three combinations and from these three combinations, only one will be used for a certain element, but not all at the same time. So for the case combination number one, I will add case number one with a factor of one, and case number four with a factor of one. Then I will click on the new button, and I will add case two and case four with a factor of one and the type of this combin case combination will be A0 as well. And finally, I will click on the new button, change the type to A0, and add case 3 and case 4 to this case combination number 3. Now you might understand better what the alternative load group 0 means. So basically, to obtain the most adverse bending moment, for example, in one beam element, the software will consider case combination 1 or 2 or 3 and calculate the bending moment from these case combinations and take the maximum from these. Now we just simply need to accept these settings or definition and we are done with the creation of load group 2.
In our model, we would like to evaluate the results of group number two according to table 4.48 from the Euro code. Therefore, we need to insert a new load group. So I will simply click on the new load group and I will add the title as GR2. The base load case number has already been increased by 100, which is very good for me at the moment. And now I would like to refer back to the slide of table 4.48 from the Euro code. Since in this diagram you can see group 2, and you can see that we need to take the frequent values of the load train LM1 tandem system loads and UDL loads. And we also need to consider the characteristic value of the horizontal forces. So I just want to point out that even if we focusing on the horizontal forces, the vertical loads with the frequent values still needs to be applied. And this is what we can set up in this new load group number three. So I will simply click on the new case button as usual, select the center alignment, but from the groups I will choose GR2 horizontal forces. For the load train I will select the LM1300 of course and please pay attention to the graphical representation of the loads on the carriageway now in this picture because what we can see is all the vertical loads are applied on the carriageway and here we can see them with their characteristic values. But of course, during the analysis, they will be multiplied with the frequent factors. And of course, together with these, the horizontal forces will be also applied with their characteristic factors or characteristic values. So, as we saw previously, I just need to repeat this procedure, create a new case, and in this case, instead of the center alignment, I will choose the right alignment of the lanes. I will choose the group to be equal with GR2. For the applied load train, I will select LM1300 as usual. I will click on the new case button again. And from the alignment, I will choose this case, the left alignment group to be equal with GR2 and the train to be LM1300. And now we have finished with the definition of the load groups in this particular example file. However, if we had other effects to be considered, for example, we would like to perform a fatigue check of any part of the structure, then we should uh, create a new action here in the action manager, which can be reached from this traffic loader task as well set up a new action for the fatigue checks by clicking on the new and select the fat fatigue for traffic loading for example and then adding to the database then going back to the traffic loader task we should create a new load group add the LM3 load model or load train to the project and create new cases with the LM3 load model and assign them to the newly created FAT FAT action. So you always need to think about what your goal is, what you would like to calculate and evaluate and create the load groups and the cases based upon this knowledge. We are finishing the traffic loader task by controlling the text output on the next tab. In this chapter, I'm going to explain a little bit about the text output of the traffic loader. After having run the traffic loader task, module Ella calculated the most severe internal forces for all the elements in the system. And you will get a very nice representation in a table format in the report browser. Also, if you go to graphics, so the old wind graph, then you can see the envelope diagram of the calculated cases. However, if you would like to have a look at the influence lines and how they were calculated, you need to make some settings here in this panel or below this tab. 
First of all, you can control the output of the report browser by selecting the manually control radio button and then one by one choosing the type of output for the load trains, the evaluation, the load positions and for the results. To change the default value you just need to simply click on it and choose the desired one from the drop-down list. For these entries normally we choose the load trains and the load positions to be presented in the report browser and we select the evaluation and the results to be with no output otherwise the report browser will have a lot of lot of pages. Please do not forget that, that the evaluation and then the representation of the results will be undertaken for every single element in the model. And that would produce a lot of unnecessary pages in the report browser. To plot out some of the influence line in the report browser though also possible. What we need to do is click on the new line and select the lane number to be plotted. For example, I will choose a number 10, which is going to be, I think, the most right alignment of the lanes. Then we can choose the element type, beam, truss, cable, spring, quad. Since our model contains only beam elements, I will choose the beam elements. And then I need to choose an element whose influence lines will be plotted. I will click on it and then choose the system visualization sign. If I click on it, I'm able to select one element. So I will choose an element in the middle. Then I will click with my right mouse button and choose the finish selection. Finally, I can select which influence line I would like to plot all or only the extrema values. I will choose to plot only the extremas. If you want to select an other element, then you simply need to click on the new and select the element which is going to be above the middle support and choose finish selection. And now I have selected the two locations that I would like to evaluate in terms of the influence lines. I would like to call your attention to the informations here. When adding a new plot in the table, please specify an element number to reduce the output. Otherwise, plot for all elements will be generated. So again, here I would like to call your attention and also the warning would like to call your attention that always choose an element. Otherwise, all the elements will be evaluated and plotted, which produces a lot of pages. If we had quad elements in our system, then it's also possible to plot the transverse influence lines of these quad elements. However, as it is stated here, the transverse influence lines are only available if one of the shell system option is selected at the transversal load distribution setting. This means that if you remember at the calculation tab, we had to select it how the interpolation, the transverse interpolation should take place a single girder system or a multi girder system but the influence line in the transverse direction will only be plotted if one of these shell system options are selected. Since we have a single girder system the plot the transverse influence line checkbox makes no sense. So finally we made all of the settings for the traffic loader task and we just simply need to click on the OK button to run it or to process it immediately. So let's click on the OK button and see the running. So first the SOFI load module is running and creating the lanes and the load trains. Then module Ella was running and finished without any error or without any warning. In the next chapter, I'm going to give you an overview of the results of the traffic loader task. In this chapter, I'm going to give you an overview of the results of the traffic loader task. After having run the traffic loader task, you need to simply right click on it and choose the report of it. You need to click on the report and the report browser will be open. As you can see here, two major module was run. The first one was the SOFI load module and the second one was module Ella. Now let's review the results together.
First in the SOFI load you have the opportunity to have a look at the geometric axis. In this case it is not so uh, interesting because we have a straight line but actually here you can see the top view of the axis normally. If we scroll down a little bit we can also identify the stations. We have one at 0 and one at 7. Then we can have a look at the segments. If we had a straight, a circle and a clotoid for example in our system that we would be able to see them here right after each other. If we scroll down the report we will find the elevation diagram of the axis and we can see also uh, the tangential intersection points at the segments. Scrolling down further we will see the placements that we created along the axis first in the form of a picture in elevation and then we can also see them by type here in the column type we can see S refers for the support, E for the end and A for the beginning. If we further scroll down we will have an overview of our lanes. In the first picture we can see the lanes from 0 to 9 and what happened here is that two lanes are overlapping each other namely the lane 0 and lane 1 and that is why it cannot be read correctly here. Basically lane 0 and lane 1 at the same position but lane 0 is wider. If we scroll even down we will find the lanes between uh, 10 and 19 so the most righted positioned lanes. Similarly a little bit down we can see the most left aligned lanes from lane 20 to 29 and after the geometrical representation we can also find the information about the lanes in a table format. This is the table that I suggest for reviewing always because it described in a very easy way to double check where is the center of your lane, where is the right edge of your lane and the left edge of the lane. As you can see here for example lane number 10 center line is at 1.1 meter and the right edge of the lane is at 2.6 meter the left edge is at minus 2.6 meter. Please notice that this is the width of the lane however the notional lane width is different is 3.0 meter. Similarly we can see lane number 20 it is a left alignment I can see it from the negative minus 1.1 meter for the YC value and I can also double check the right and the left edge of my lanes. Then if we scroll down we will find the actions within our project which is in this case maybe not so relevant. What is more important is the information about the load train. Here we can read what type of load train we are using, the LM1300 according to EN1991-2 and we can find the load values. For example the axle load is equal with 300 kN. If we had a special national annex then these remarks would show the factor for this axle load or traffic load or residual area load respectively. Since we are using the general euro code now, the 1.0 factors were applied. If we scroll down in the report, then we are going to see a graphical representation of our load train. Here we can see the 300 kN axle loads and also the UDL load of the load train. The horizontal load, such as the brake load for example, is going to be calculated with 2.7 multiplied with the L value, but the maximum value of it cannot be greater than 900 kN. Then in the picture we can see that this uh, braking load is with a factor 1.0 will be applied on the structure. Scrolling given down we will find the load elements of the load train. In this table we can see the two axle loads being equal with 300 kN and also we can find the UDL load 27.0 kN per meter if we divided this with the uh, width of 
the vehicle which is 3 meter and this is also the width of the notional lane then 27 divided by 3 we are going to get the 9 kN per square meter loading that was all the information that we received from uh, Sophie Load and now if we scroll down we will reach the output of module ELA first again we are going to see the lane axis that the load will be applied to in this case it is called axis and we can see the first evaluation case what we had just set up for the tendon system and we added the name TS in this case we assigned to uh, the lane number one the tandem load of LM1 this is what you can also see below so the lane one was the center alignment of the lanes and actually we positioned the tandem loads of LM1 in this picture you can also see the left and the right edge of the lane and you can also see where the tendon system load applied. From the above table now you might understand how the load readout from a predefined load train works. As you can see a predefined load train can have many type of loading. It could contain point loads, UDL loads, residual area loads, braking loads, transversal loads, if we have an axis along an arc or a circle then we can have transversal fugal forces in other words centrifugal forces and we can also have transverse forces coming from the wind if a load train has these type of loads then we can simply read it out by activating the certain load type in this case we just activated the point loads of the LM1 load train with a factor of 1.0 and positioned in lane 1. If we scroll down we will see our second case which was set up for the tendon system loading again but in this case we loaded lane 10 which was the most right alignment of the lanes as you can see in the picture below the tendon system loads are on the right side and the YC value of the lane is at 1.1 meter then we can review a case number three for the tendon system load in lane 20 which was the most left alignment and the YC value of the lane is at minus 1.1 meter these information are in chapter Geometry and Evaluation Case 1, 2, 3 and then the report shows the influence lines but now we are going to see our other cases that was set up for the UDL load so I will click on the Evaluation Case number 1 UDL load again what we can see here is that we set up a case number 1 for the UDL load of the LM1 load train and we position the UDL load in lane number 1 from this line of the table we can see that we are going to read out the loading of this load train and really in the below picture you can see that lane number 1 is loaded with the UDL load the 9 kN per square meter and the residual area is loaded with the 2.5 kN per square meter loading then we will find in case 2 and case 3 the most right alignment of the UDL loads and the most left alignment of the UDL loads finally we will find our case 4 in the UDL loads in which we loaded lane 0 and in this case we only utilize the residual area load of the LM1 load train with the value of 2.5 kN per square meter and if I scroll down the page you will see this uh, graphically presented only the cycleways footways are loaded with the residual area load then if you may remember we have set up combinations because we didn't know what is going to be our governing case and we combine together case number one with a factor of one and case four with a factor of one 
then case 2 with case 4 and case 3 with case 4. All of them was assigned to an alternative load group 0, so it means they are mutually exclusive and only one of them will be selected. Ok, so now we reach the load cases uh, in the report browser and again we are going to get the influence line diagrams from these evaluation cases but first I would like to go through together with you the evaluation case number one for the horizontal loads. So if I click on the evaluation case number one GR2 we are going to see the following table. Here we would like to utilize the GR2, so the group 2 of table 4.48 from the Euro code. And in this case, the software will automatically know that the horizontal forces should be taken with a factor of 1.0, as you can see in the table. The point loads, however, will be taken only with a factor of 0.75, the UDL loads with a 0.40, and the residual area loads also with the 0.40 factor. Of course in the graphical representation we can see only the point loads, UDL load and the residual area loads. The horizontal loads cannot really be applied in this type of graphic. However we can see lane number one being loaded with the loads. Then in the forthcoming cases we can see the most right and the most left alignment as usual. So now we reviewed all the load positioned cases and now we can go back and have a look at the influenced lines in our project. As you remember we have selected one specific beam to see the influenced line diagrams but do not get a huge size of report with a lot of pages. What I'm going to see is the normal force influence diagram of the questionable beam. It is presented on an A4 paper, so maybe we can have a better uh, understanding and a better visualization if we click on the graphics tab and select the same normal force influence diagram for this beam element. And if we zoom out a little bit using my middle mouse button, we can see that on one A4 page there are three influence line diagrams the minimum and maximum influence line diagram for the corresponding internal force and the name of the graphic is always inherited from the very first internal force influence line diagram. So the first influence line diagram is the maximum normal force influence line then we can see the maximum VY influence line and on the next page we are going to find the minimum VY influence line. So if we would like to find the MY bending moment influence line diagram we should click on the NY. As it shows there is only one MY bending moment influence line diagram on this page. So now we can figure out that the other MY influence line diagram must be on the previous page and yes there is or it is and we can see this is the maximum NY influence line diagram. In this picture we can see two type of graph lines one with continuous line and the other one is dashed or dotted line. The continuous one stands for the vertical loads and the dotted one stands for the horizontal loads. So in this case, for example, the dotted one shows an influence line diagram from which the maximum MY bending moment diagram could be extracted if the load is positioned in the most severe way on this dotted diagram. But for now, focus on the continuous line which gives us the maximum MY bending moment at this cross section the red arrows are representing uh, the axle loads of low train LM1 and the picture also shows their most severe location position on the MY influence line diagram to cause the maximum MY bending moment 
in the selected beam element at the selected cross section. Similarly, if we look at the minimum MY influence line diagram, we will see the loads positioned in a way that it will cause the greatest minimum MY bending moment in the selected beam element at the selected cross section. Now let's have a look at the MY influence diagram of the other selected beam. Simply we just go to the left part of our screen and choose the MT and here we can find the maximum MY influence line diagram. As you can see the shape of the influence line diagram is totally different. Now we are looking for the maximum and minimum MY bending moment in this beam at this cross section. The minimum MY bending moment at this cross section could be get when we have the loading somewhere here. Of course for the maximum MY bending moment at this cross section will occur when we load the positive part of this influence line and this is what we can see in this picture the greatest ordinate of the positive part of the influence line is loaded with the 300 kN axle load if we scroll down the page or click on the next graphic we are going to see that the axle load is positioned into the location where it causes the biggest minimum MY bending moment in the selected beam at the selected cross section. And yes, we can verify that really one of the axle load was positioned right over the greatest ordinate, negative ordinate of this diagram. It could be also interesting to see the MY bending moment from the UDL load, so I will just simply click on the graphic of the first beam and on the MT, because now I know I will find the maximum MY influence diagram there. And as one can expect, to get the maximum positive MY bending moment in the beam at this cross section, we need to load the positive area of the influence line diagram. Hence we can see the 27 kN per meter UDL load on this part and also at the very end of the axis where we can also have a positive part of the influence line. Similarly, if we would like to see the loading to get the minimum MY bending moment in the beam element at the cross section, we need to load the negative part of the influence line with the UDL load. What is also interesting in this case to have a look at the MT diagram and zoom in a little bit. If I zoom in further, we can notice that we have two values here, 3.6 and 5.5. Why is that? The reason behind can be best explained in this slide. If we look at, for example, lane number 10, we can see that the YC, the center of the lane, is at positive 1.1 meter measured from the center of gravity, so somewhere here. However, the width of the load train is 3 meter. So, if we measure 1.5 meter from this point, the left edge of the vehicle will be somewhere here, which is 0 0.4 meter away from the center of gravity. And of course, uh, the loading on the left side causes a torsional bending moment with a different sign than the loading on the right side. So if you want to, for example, calculate the torsional bending moment that rotates the whole structure to the right, then you need to take the loading on the right side measure from the center of gravity. And this is a different value than the loading on the left side, which rotates the structure to the left. Hence, you have to see two loading values in the empty torsional influence line diagram. And this is exactly what we can observe if we look at uh, this empty influence line diagram in the report browser. So actually, in this way, we can have a look at all of the influence line diagrams if we want to. 
but currently one thing is missing from the report browser, namely the results of the result sets. <clears throat> and this is something that I'm going to show you in the next chapter, how you can get these results as well. In this chapter I'm going to show you how to set up the traffic loader task to obtain the results of the result sets as well. To be able to inquire the results of the result sets, we must use text input. First, let's have a look at what is behind the traffic loader graphical task. If we right click on the traffic loader graphical task, I can choose from the drop down menu the text editor task. It will open Teddy for me. With this approach, we have the opportunity to review and understand the text input behind the graphical task. As we learned in the Teddy chapter, uh, the input always starts with the name of the module, then a headline and finally an end line. And in between we can see the commands. After setting the page settings of the report browser, the first important command for us is the lane command. Here we are defining the lanes along the axis, which is called axis in our project. Then we choose the type from the predefined uh, lane distribution, which is in this case going to follow the Eurocon lane distribution. Then we need to set the edge of the curbstone on the left side and on the right side, which is equal with 2.6 meter in our project. And then we also need to define the width of the superstructure or the outermost fiber of the footways, which is equal with minus 3.15 meter and plus 3.15 meter in our project. Then we add a line of uh, the output or regarding the output in the report browser. The command echo lane full is going to plot all the information regarding the lanes in the report browser. Then in the next command line we create a new load case with a number 1200. This load case is not going to be assigned to any action and this is why I have chosen here type none. We can add a title to this load case which is going to be EN1991 2 load model LM1. Within this load case we define a load train with command tray. From the directory of the predefined load trains we are going to call out the LM1 load train with the 300 kN axle load, with the 9 kN per square meter UDL load, and with the 2.5 kN per square meter residual area load. We can also find the maximum value of the braking force at parameter P8. We also define the width of the load train with the parameter WIDT. And the parameter PFAC1 means an overall factor for the total load train. If you do not know the meaning of the command on any of the parameters, you just simply need to click on the command name and push the F1 button on your keyboard and the online help will be open for you. Finally, the module ends with the end command. Now we can see the input of module ELLA. Again, the module starts with the command PROG, followed by the command HEAD. Then with command PAGE and SIZE we can control the page, the A4 page in the report browser. Then we can see some ECHO commands here, with which we can control how much output we would like to get in the report browser. For example, we can see that we would like to get an output of the load trains and the full output of the load positions. But the details of the evaluation is out of interest. With the show command we can trigger the representation of the influence line for beam 200,017 and 200,035. And with the E-type extreme we just instruct the software that we would like to get the extrema diagrams. Then with command L cell we need to select the lane to be evaluated 
and we can also control the evaluation with the parameter int and dz for example. The parameter int uh, controls the transverse interpolation of the influence. If it is set to zero then it means we have a single girder system. dz is the projection of the, the load within the lane, we already discussed it in the graphical input. And with the forthcoming calc commands, we activate the calculation of the influenced line for the internal force N, VY, VZ, MT, MY, MZ, the spring forces and the displacements in the global X, Y, Z. The results will be stored in a so-called result load case. And the result load case number is normally a three-digit number whose last two digits will be inherited from this command line. For example, the maximum normal force influence diagram will be stored in 102, the minimum in 101. Then with command apply, RPPL, we can control the direction of the unit force. If it is set to full, then it means not just uh, in vertical direction the unit load will be moved, but also in the horizontal and longitudinal direction as well. For 3D system, this is the normal setting. Then if we scroll down a little bit, we can see the cases that we set up as follows. First, we set up with the save command a result load case number with the parameter LCB. Then we need to decide into which action the results should be assigned to. In this case, the results should be assigned to action GR underscore T, so for the action for the tendon system. If you want, you can also add a title to this load case. Then we create the case with command case with the number 1 and we need to choose the load group. In this case, in the first case, we selected GR0, which means we would like to read out only the vertical forces of the load train. Then with the command POSL, we need to position the loading. In this case 1, we would like to position it on axis in lane 1. Then we need to instruct the software which load train we would like to position. In this case, the train that was stored in load case 1200 with a factor of 1. And the remaining parameters can be left as the defaults. But if you want, with the help of the online menu, you can check these parameters and set them if you want to such as the eccentricity of the train or the synchronization of the load train and so on and so forth. In the second case we also uh, defined and used only the vertical loads of the load train but in this case we positioned the same load train in lane 10. Finally in the third case we positioned a uh, train 1200 into lane 20. Then we have created a new result load case for the forthcoming cases with number 200. In this time the result load cases will be assigned to action GR underscore U which was created for the UDL loads of the traffic. Then we set up case 1 again but in this case for the UDL type of loads of the load train. We position the UDL loads of train 1200 in lane 1. Then in case 2 in lane 10. Finally in case 3 in lane 20. Then in the forthcoming case number 4 we read out the UDL part loadings of the load train 1200 with regards of the footway loadings. Uh, this is why we entered here for the group parameter GR3. And this means that in lane 0 
a UDL load of 2.5 kN per square meter will be applied on the food quays. Then we had to combine these cases, which can be undertaken by command comb. Then we need to enter the type of the superposition, which is in this case A0. Then we need to enter the cases with their factor, as you can see in the first line and the lines below. Lastly, we set up a new load group with the result load case number 300. And in this case, we would like to assign the result load cases to action GR underscore 2, which was set up for the horizontal loadings. We created case number 1. The group to be used was GR2, which stands for the horizontal type of loading of the load train. Then we positioned load train 1200 in lane 1, 10 and 20 respectively into case 1, 2, 3. Okay, so basically that's all the input what we entered graphically. And as you can see, this input is not so difficult. So next time, or when you are a little bit more advanced, then you can try to enter the input with text. Because if you get the hang of it, it's going to be much, much faster than the graphical input. Okay, we need to insert some line to accommodate or to get the results of the result sets here as well. Okay, now we just need to insert some lines, some common lines, to get the results of the R sets as well. Before I do it, let's call up the online help by command calc and have a look at the syntax of this command. The first parameter after the command calc is the type which is a variable for which of the influence line should be evaluated. If we scroll down this page, we can see the available options. And these options given finite element wise. For example, for beam elements, we can calculate the following internal forces. Normal force, shear force in two directions, torsional bending moment, uh, vertical bending moment, horizontal bending moment, and so on and so forth. For truss, cable, and spring elements, we can evaluate the truss force in the trusses, the cable force in the cables, the spring force and the spring moments, and the transfer spring forces. For shell elements or disc and plate elements, we can evaluate the corresponding internal stresses. And for nodes, we can evaluate the global displacements and the global rotations. Please notice that it is not possible to evaluate reaction forces, or it is also not possible, for example, to evaluate bedding forces along a beam element or on a surface. However, we can see here that, for example, the result sets are possible to evaluate and basically the corresponding syntax will be after the parameter type we just need to enter R set colon and then the name of the result set or I should say it's either the ID of the result set or the number of the result set so without further ado I will just simply insert the syntax into Teddy and then we can discuss it of course, as usual, the corresponding model file will be available for you with this current input as well. After having inserted the input, you can see that I have started with a label which says or states addition of result sets. This is a new syntax and you haven't met before. If you type exclamation mark, asterisk, exclamation mark, label, it will create a new label in the calculation panel with the name addition of R sets, of course. In the next line, I have defined a variable start and the value of this variable is 21. You might remember the let variable defines a variable only within this current module. In a forthcoming module, the start variable will be unknown. 
Okay, so basically I'm inserting again the command calc, but instead of the available types n, y, 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 z, and so on and so forth, I just entered for the type r set column px, for example. And then as additional parameters, I defined l max and l min, where the l min will be equal at the beginning 21 and the L max will be equal with 21 plus 1 since the value of the start variable is 21. Then in the forthcoming lines the L max values are always increased by 2 similarly the L min values. In order for this input to work of course you need to predefine the R sets as we did in the result sets for spring task. As a reminder, if we open it up, you can see that basically here we set up the result sets with the ID PX, PY, PZ, BX, BY, VZ, and finally PX, PY, PZ. And what we had assigned to these uh, IDs were the spring force, the spring deformations, and the rotation of the spring elements. Since these result set has an ID, I can simply refer to these IDs in module Ella, and then Ella will evaluate the maximum and minimum spring force from the given spring. We should not forget that we also set up an an additional result set for the pile footing where we also uh, identified MX, MY, MZ as result sets to extract the moment of the springs at the pile foot. Therefore, I can also refer to this MX, MY, MZ in the calculation within module ELLA. Okay, now I will simply close back the result sets for springs by right-clicking on it and choose the close. And there is one very important information that I need to further elaborate here. And it is the following. We open this text editor by simply right-clicking on the traffic loader task and choose the text editor option. Now, of course, I can run this task by right-clicking on it and choose the Calculate Traffic Loader task. And in this way, module SOFILOAD and ELLA will be triggered with the current input. However, if I close back this text input or simply double-clicking on the traffic loader and open the graphical task, then the value I had just entered will disappear. The reason behind is that every graphical input within a task will overwrite the text input. Let me demonstrate it for you. So I will simply right click on this traffic loader task, close it, and then I will open up the traffic loader once more without selecting the process immediately option I will just simply click on the OK button with this I have simply accepted the changes if there is any in this dialog box and now if I open the traffic loader with a right mouse click again and choosing the text editor you can see that the input for the result sets is gone that's why my suggestion for this workflow is the following. Simply close now back the traffic loader and we just need to simply copy this traffic loader graphical task by right clicking on it and choose the copy task. Then we can rename it. For example, traffic loader with result sets and now, instead of choosing the text editor, first we must convert this to a user task by selecting the convert to user task option. In this way, this is going to be a text input forever. 
and you do not need to be afraid of that if you open it up again then the text input will be gone. So as now this task is a text input I just simply make some space here and insert the input for the result sets and everything is okay and fine now. The only remaining thing is to run this task and have a look at the results. So let's do that. I'm going to right click on this newly created text task and choose the calculate traffic loader with R sets. And to evaluate the results in the report browser, I'm going to show everything in the next chapter. In this chapter we are going to review the results of the traffic loader with result sets. But before we go into details, now we have two traffic loader tasks. One with a graphical input and one with a text input in which the result sets definition can also be found. To be sure that the next time when I'm opening this file not to run the traffic loader, I'm just going to simply right click on the traffic loader task and choose the text editor option. As you can see by default the module Sophie load and Ella will be run the next time because I can see a plus sign next to the module names. If I deselect these two modules or I change the plus to a minus sign then it will be sure that the next time when I'm running this model these two modules will not be run. Okay, after having set this I will simply right click on the traffic loader text input and choose the close. Okay, and also the traffic loader uh, with the result set has run successfully so now we just need to look at the results. In order to do that I'm going to set up again interactive graphics and interactive tables the way how I am creating it is not important at the moment. I'm gonna teach you how to do that later. So now I will just simply insert into the project and we will have a look at the results together. So I have created an interactive table for the results of the result sets received from the traffic loader task. Now I just need to simply right click on it and choose the calculate option and then if we go to the report we can see the results of the result sets and we can discuss it. If I now click on the first entry line I will be able to see the results of the support at the first axis line on the left side. But you can also orientate yourself if you read the title of the table. This is the result set S1L Spring Support Axis 1 on the left side. From the first line of the table we will see what results will be available for us. So the load case will be presented and the load case titles and the internal forces that were extracted from the result sets such as the PX, PY, PZ in kilonewton, then the deflections in the global X, Y, Z directions in millimeter and finally the rotation uh, about the X, Y, Z axis in MRAD. In the table we will find the envelope load cases from the traffic loader task. For example load case 121 that was created to extract the minimum PX values in the springs and then it causes uh, these amount of forces or deflections or rotations in the spring element. You can also see from the title, from the load case title, that these results are coming from the tandem system loads until this point when load case 221 already shows the results of the UDL load. So if we scroll down the table a little bit we will see the load cases uh, coming from the UDL part of the LM1 load train and as you remember we set up case 3 for the horizontal loads and you can see the results of the horizontal loads from load case 321 to 338. 
and in the legend of the table you can find a small reminder that basically we have created the result sets for the springs uh, 200,101 to 103 and from these springs we wanted to extract the spring forces plus uh, the deflections or the deformations and the springs with the number 200,104 to 106 were, were created to extract the rotation of the spring elements. In an absolutely similar manner or fashion, the results are available also for the result sets at the first axis on the right side. You just need to click on it and the table will be loaded or presented for you. And the structure of this table is exactly the same as I showed you at the axis on the left. Okay, so this is one type of representation of the results of the result sets. But now I would like to show you another way, namely the but now I would like to show you another type which is creating interactive graphics. In SSD now I'm going to create a new interactive graphic. Again, the way how I'm going to do this will be covered later in the training. Now I will just simply insert it into the SSD task tree and we can have a look at the results of it. As you can see I have created this interactive graphic called plot of the traffic loads and YMZ. I just simply need to uh, right click on it and choose the calculate option and then we can have a results view in the report browser. Now we can see the results on the A4 paper but if we go to the graphics we can have a look at uh, these pictures what I have just created. In the first picture we can see the structure itself from the left to the right along the axis and basically what I'm presenting in this diagram is the bending moment MY from load case 109 which is the minimum MY bending moment from the tandem system loads. This is presented with the red color and also within the same picture I'm presenting load case 110, which was set up for the maximum MY bending moments from the tendon system loads. With this type of representation, namely to uh, present two layers of results in one picture, you can get a very nice envelope diagram about the MY bending moment from the tendon system. In a very similar way, I have created a new picture presenting load case 209 and 210 on our superstructure. And these load cases, as you may remember, were coming from the UDL part of the LM1 loading. In the next graphic, I have created again two new pictures. In the first one, I'm presenting the minimum and maximum MY bending moment envelope from the horizontal loads. GR2 and in the very last picture I am presenting load case 311 and 12 which are for the maximum and minimum uh, MZ bending moment diagram from the horizontal loads of GR2. Okay so this is another way or option to represent the results of the traffic loader task. And now I will show you a third option with which we are going to look at the change of the MY bending moment along a superstructure in table format. So I'm back to SSD and I'm going to create a very similar interactive table. After having created it and inserted it into the SSD task tree, I just simply need to run this new interactive table by selecting the calculate. And now we can have a look at the report of this task. In the report browser you just simply need to select the chapter and on the right side the table will be presented. As you can see from the title it represents load case 110 which is the maximum MY bending moment diagram from the tandem system loads. The structural elements are presented along the axis and also in this table we will found the beam element forces. 
So we can see that we are reviewing the results along the axis called axis. We can find in the second column the station value of the axis starting from 10 and goes all the way to 64.6 meter as far as I remember. And then in the next column we can see the number of the beam elements, the values at the beginning and at the end of this beam element and finally we will find the internal forces. If we have a closer look on the MY bending moments we can see that from zero it starts to increasing very nicely similarly to the plot that I showed in the interactive graphics. So this is the third way and also very useful way to represent the results after the traffic loader tasks. Having said that we conclude this chapter and now we are going to continue with the construction stages in the next chapter. Before we do that I suggest you to go back to SSD and save the project.